And as you're seated, if you would, if you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. As Josiah mentioned earlier, today launches our Missions Emphasis Week. And in many ways, it feels like 2017 is something like a Missions Emphasis year, at least to me. Not because we've done some sort of special, new, or big initiative per se, but because on Sunday mornings throughout 2017 thus far, we've been in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts has a very unique missionary missions emphasis. If you had to reduce the book of Acts to a single theme or idea, it would be hard to argue with that theme being the gospel spreading to the nations. That's what missions is. That's what the mission is. The thesis statement of Acts, which was at the end of that video you saw at the beginning of our service, if you were in when the video was still going on, it's Acts 1 age. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, by the end of the book of Acts, it's almost like that has begun to be fulfilled. The gospel has gone from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and is beginning to take launch into the ends of the earth. The book of Acts ends with the Apostle Paul in the city of Rome, which was considered in some ways sort of the western end of the known world. Never mind Britain, which Rome overtook in about you know, 40 AD or something like that, so a little bit before the book of Acts was written. In their minds, ugh, Britain was like Mars to us. So Rome, the city of Rome, was like the ends of the earth. So from one angle, the book of Acts, what it promised to set out to do, it does and yet we know the story goes on. We know the work isn't done. We know it didn't go to the ends of the ends of the earth. And so even today, 2,000 years later almost, the mission continues. Habakkuk 2 envisioned a day when God's glory would cover the earth like waters cover the sea. In other words, completely. Revelation 5 envisioned Heaven one day in the future, in eternity, with a multitude redeemed in heaven, which no man can number from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. We're not there yet. There are still 7,000 people groups, ethnicities, cultures, or, or languages that are properly labeled unreached. Unreached with the gospel, that is, there is no decent Christian presence and witness there. And so the gospel must continue. It must continue to spread within these reached people groups, in these reached cities like Albuquerque. And it must continue to spread to less reached or even unreached places and peoples. And that means then that some will have to go to faraway places where the gospel is not yet known, where it's not yet prevalent, which means they'll have to leave home, they'll have to leave comforts, they'll have to pick up and go. And the rest of us who don't go will have to support them with prayer, with encouragement, and with finances. So that's what we do as a church in large part. That's what we aim to do. We aim to do it more. We aim to do it better. That's part of why we have something we, we call Missions Emphasis Week. Not so that we can once a year get this off our minds or off our hearts or convictions and sort of you know, talk about this a little bit for a while. But no, no, we need to all year round think of missions, think of the gospel spreading among the nations. Uh, but it's good for us to have at least once a year where we are intense and focused on this topic of the gospel among the nations. We have a lot to do. It's going to be hard. It has been hard. The gospel going forth to the nations isn't easy. It's not, it's not easy to let goods and kindred go, as Martin Luther wrote. But we can't let up. We can't 
take our foot off the pedal. We can't get distracted or become weary or indifferent. And so we'll need ongoing, not just yearly, once a year, encouragement, but we'll need ongoing encouragement. So where do we go for that? How do we get it? How do we keep our foot on the pedal? How do we not get discouraged or become indifferent? John Piper asks, what should a pastor do to promote a passion among his people to see God glorified in missions? Then he answers, above everything else, be the kind of preacher whose theme and passion is the majesty of God. No church will be able to rise to the magnificence of the missionary cause of Christ if they do not feel the magnificence of Christ himself. There will be no big world vision without a big God. There will be no passion to draw others near or far into the joy of our worship where there is no passionate joy in worship. The most important thing pastors can do to arouse and sustain a passion for world evangelization is week in and week out to help their people see the crags and the peaks and icy cliffs of the snow-capped heights of God's majestic character. Not in the context of casualness and triviality and Sunday morning slapstick, but in the context of exaltation and awe and solemnity and earnestness and intensity. How will people ever come to know and feel the crags and peaks and snow-capped heights of God's glory if our preaching and worship services are more like picnics in the valley than thunder on the ice face of Mount Everest? End of quote. Now, sometimes in Scripture, God's majestic glory is shown to us in who he is, in what he's like, maybe in a a vision of himself. I think of Isaiah 6. But sometimes in Scripture, God's majestic glory and strength and beauty is shown to us in what he does. That makes me think of the book of Acts. I pray that our study in the book of Acts this year has given fuel for our gospel-spreading efforts home and abroad because we have seen Christ at work in mighty and glorious ways, and we know he's still at work. In Acts 17, we get this wonderful phrase, which by itself ought to light a fire under us. It by itself should give fuel to the fire. Verse 7 of Acts 17 They were turning the world upside down with their their teaching about Jesus. Isn't that a great phrase, turning the world upside down? It's actually a phrase coined by the opponents of the Apostle Paul as an accusation, as a bad thing. And in some ways it wasn't true, as we'll see in just a minute. It was actually the opponents who were more accurately turning things upside down than Paul and his associates. But Paul's message is one to bring peace, not turn things upside down. And yet, not all receive that message, and some oppose it vehemently, and things get turned upside down. Or we could say, in an upside down world, the gospel turns things right side up. I think Luke gives this phrase to us, put here on the lips of Paul's opponents, in a tongue-in-cheek sort of way. It was wrong what they said about Paul. It was a false accusation. He wasn't turning things over. He wasn't turning things upside down. But, but Luke knows that we can catch on and that with a wink, this is a beautiful line. And the Christian mission is something like this. In an upside-down world, we are turning things aright. So let's look at the first 15 verses of Acts 17 this morning. Now when they had passed through Amphilius, Amphipolis, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, 
And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. And the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now here we have the account of two cities, Thessalonica and Berea. There are some differences between what happens in these cities, but also some obvious similarities. They follow the same pattern. The gospel is proclaimed, some believe, others don't, and in the end, the missionaries move on down the road because of the fierceness of the opposition. That happens in each of these cities. In fact, that happens in many of the cities that we see in the book of Acts, hasn't it? Isn't this a familiar trend? The gospel's proclaimed, some will believe, some won't. And you'll either move on down the road because you decide to, or because an angel told you to, or because persecution forces you to. It's the same pattern over and over again. In fact, we might, at this point, now 17 chapters in, wonder if there's anything new to learn from this familiar pattern. Well, number one, yes, there is something new to learn even in the pattern itself. This is the pattern. This is the way it goes. This is church history for 2,000 years now. The gospel's proclaimed, some believe, some don't, and it keeps going. And it keeps going. And it keeps going. There's a lesson in that, right? There's a lesson in the repetition and the similarities between the stories in the book of Acts. But there are also, in this passage, some new, fresh details. In every one of the stories, in every one of the cities where the gospel comes in the book of Acts, there's something different that the author, Luke, is trying to show us and, and teach us, and we've got to look for what's new. And so we'll look for new lessons in these verses this morning. I have four observations for us from these 15 verses of Acts 17. Number one, we must reason from the Scriptures. We must reason from the scriptures. Now, we've read of Paul presenting the gospel in synagogues before, but here Luke emphasizes this method of reasoning. Verse 2, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Verse 3, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and die and be raised from the dead. Notice Paul starts with Scripture. He doesn't start with pure reason. He doesn't reason things out of thin air like a secular philosopher might do. He starts with Scripture. That's the basis. That's the authority. 
but he doesn't merely quote Scripture and let it sort of just float out there. He compares Scripture with Scripture, no doubt. He argues his case. He has a point. He, he proves his argument. He anticipates questions and perhaps rebuttals and then answers those questions and rebuttals and no doubt answers them with more Scripture. He did this for three weeks, we're told, with the goal of these people in Thessalonica being persuaded, verse 4, persuaded from the Scriptures. Now, we've seen in earlier sermons in the book of Acts how they use the Old Testament to get to Jesus. We've seen where they go. Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, Isaiah 53. These are the classics in the book of Acts that keep getting used. And no doubt Paul knew about these hot spots in the Old Testament that so clearly and easily point to Christ. I'm sure he used passages like that. Passages that rightly understood foresaw Messiah not only coming, but him dying and being raised. And so Paul argues that it's necessary. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer and die and be raised according to the Scriptures. This is the language that Jesus used in Luke 24 when he was walking on the road to Emmaus with those, those men, and he taught them the Scriptures. He asked them, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer and to be raised? He rebuked them for not heeding and hearing what the prophets had already told. This is in the prophets. It's necessary for the Christ to die and be raised. And this ran against the grain of the Judaism in the days of Jesus and in the days of Paul. They envisioned a Messiah coming who would be a great, mighty warrior king, and he would kick butt. He would set Rome aright, and he would do away with anyone else in the land. And Jesus came and wasn't that kind of a king, was he? He came to deal with sin not just specific kind of sinners. And so it was there all along. They didn't see it, but they should have. And Paul now, with new eyes to see, can show them where it is and what it says and what it means. It was necessary. He's making a case. He's reasoning and explaining, and he's, he's proving, as Peter did in Acts chapter 2, as, as Stephen did in Acts chapter 7, as Paul did in Acts chapter 13. In those passages, we get the content of what was said here in Acts 17. There's no content, really, just method. Scriptures about Christ and specifically his death and resurrection, argued, reasoned, proven, shown to be necessary. Now, by the way, this is biblical preaching. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, preach the what? Preach the word, not preach yourself, not preach the culture, not preach politics, not preach what comes across as hip today, not preach emotionally touching stories, preach the word. Biblical preaching draws from the scriptures, leans on the scriptures, points to the scriptures, then it focuses on Christ and specifically his death and his resurrection. Everything flows into that Friday and Sunday, death and resurrection, or flows out of it, the death and resurrection. Biblical preaching then reasons and explains and proves, and it makes a case. It has an argument, and again, it does it from the Scriptures, so to the degree that a church either commits to these things or exchanges them for things that are more palatable, well, there you have a litmus test. It's not the only litmus test for a faithful church, but it is an important one. 
Is it word-focused, Christ-centered? Does it have a point of eternal significance? But Paul's model here is also a model for any and all evangelism, not just public preaching. I don't mean that we should go to synagogues as Paul did here. For one reason, most of us aren't Jewish. Another reason is that none of us are Saul of Tarsus, a former Pharisee. But whoever it is that we're hoping to engage with the gospel, wherever we can use the scriptures, Whenever we can get to Christ, and specifically his death and resurrection, that's what saves people, not just his love. And whenever we can make a case for Christ, whenever we can make a case for the need for his death, well, we should make a case. This is what C.S. Lewis did when he coined those three options for who Jesus was according to the biblical record. The three L's. Either Jesus was a liar, lunatic, or Lord. Either he was making up what he said, either he was crazy and thought what he said was true, but it wasn't, or what he said was true, and he's God in the flesh. Those are three options and three I think good arguments from Scripture. You don't have to have a PhD in apologetics to try to make a case to a non-Christian. Heck, just lean on Lewis. Just quote him. Don't reinvent the wheel. Be a one-trick pony. Memorize the Romans road and stick to it. Have a couple of good lines, a good a couple of good questions. Use Scripture and trust God to bless Scripture. You know, there are still some people, even in our 21st century American postmodern culture, who have some measure of respect for the Bible, or at least some genuine curiosity about the Bible. There are still people out there like that. We can take this principle of Paul using the scriptures and reasoning from the scriptures, even in our context today. Ask someone if they'd like to read the Bible with you every Thursday over coffee. And if that thought just terrifies you, that you would kind of play a lead role with a non-Christian in reading the Bible together on a weekly basis, then read David Helm's book, a little short book, One-to-One Bible Reading. And I'll give you five bucks if afterwards you are not itching to read through the gospel according to Mark with someone. Yes, of course, God must open the heart for non-Christians to truly receive what they hear and what they read. We learned that last week from the book of Acts in chapter 16, or a couple of weeks ago rather, when, when God opened the heart of Lydia so that she believed yeah, we, that's already been established. We know that. That's why we don't just proclaim and, and simply trust in our reasoning skills. We pray. We ask God to open someone's heart. But we don't just pray and wait for him to open the heart. We proclaim. We plead. We make an argument. So use the scriptures. Get to Christ. Make a case. Explain, reason, persuade, and repeat. It may take three weeks. It may take 30 years. They may never come to believe. But some, some might. I love that word some. Verse 4, some of them were persuaded. And joined Paul and Silas. Notice that. Becoming a Christian is becoming persuaded and then also identifying with God's people. Who did? Well, some of the Jews. But then also, verse 4, a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. That's going to become relevant in our next section. So our second lesson, we must expect senseless rejection. 
We must expect senseless rejection. Verses 5 through 9 of our chapter record the negative responses that come from Paul's message. Verse 4 was the positive response. Verses 5 through 9 are negative. Again, we've seen that in the book of Acts. The gospel is proclaimed and it divides. It's a fork in the road. There's an audience of a whole before they hear, and then all of a sudden some embrace and some either indifferently walk away or even outright reject and oppose. And that's the case here. And in verse 5, we find out that the opposition that they're about to face springs from jealousy. Jealousy. Do you see that? Verse 5. What are they jealous of? Well, likely they're jealous of Paul's success and his influence, especially with so many devout Greeks, verse 4 says. That's another way of referring to this category called God-fearers. If you remember a while back in our study, there's a different category called proselytes, and those are Gentiles who essentially become Jewish with circumcision and obeying the food laws. God-fearers, also called devout Greeks, are a little bit less than that. They acknowledge Yahweh God as the true God, and they selectively follow his laws, but that's about it. These people are about as good a candidate as you can get for one day becoming proselytes, becoming Jews. They're they're almost there, but they're not there. And Paul comes to town, and he's got this message about Jesus, and he gets them, a lot of them. And they're jealous. You see, it's senseless, isn't it? It's senseless rejection. They're jealous about this, not asking why They don't believe it themselves, but instead mad that others do. The the leading women in the town, uh, prominent women, wealthy women, they're also believing, and they're jealous. And so they conspire against the followers of Christ in a variety of ways. Notice, first they round up the riffraff around town. They're called the rabble. Isn't that a great word? You'll see some rabble around town. You can now have this word, look, rabble. You know, loafers, loiterers, troublemakers, people looking for a fight. Well, these Jews get those guys and they form a mob. You've got religious Jews and you've got rowdy Gentiles now conspiring together. They got the city in an uproar. They go looking for Paul and his men. They come to Jason's house. Perhaps this is the formation of a the early church meeting in his house, or perhaps Jason had uh, provided hospitality for Paul and Silas and others. But Paul isn't there, and so they drag Jason and a few other new Christians out of the house and to the city authorities, it says. By the way, side note, you see city authorities in verse 6? In the Greek, that's a word, politarch. This is the only place in all of ancient literature where you find this word, politarch. And for a lot, a lot of years, it baffled the historians, many of them wondering whether the Bible was inaccurate and fictional at this point, making up a a category of government that no other document in ancient history ever displays until they found several inscriptions in the town of Thessalonica. In the last century or so, they found 16 of these same inscriptions with this word politarch on it. You see, Thessalonica was uh, an independent city, independent of Rome, and so they had their own forms of government and their own labels for offices. So the politarch are the magistrates of the city, So not only is the Bible not in error here, but it is the sole ancient document to speak of something that archaeology would take 1,900 years to prove true. By the way, then, if you come across things that seem to be in contradiction in the Bible, it might be safe to just wait around, maybe up to 1,900 years. Back to this makeshift trial. They have two primary charges they lay down. Verse 6, these men have turned the world upside down, and now they've come here also. 
Now, with both of their charges, there's going to be some truth and something trumped up. It's going to be false and it's going to be true. Here, these men have turned the world upside down. Well, well, that's not true. Paul and his company haven't come to Thessalonica to cause trouble. They've come with good news, good news of great joy, the forgiveness of sins. Messiah has come. This is reason for celebration. But it's kind of true. They've been turning the world upside down. I mean, just think of their last city, Philippi. We saw it last week. Remember, there some get mad because they're businessmen who have a slave girl who's demon-possessed, and she's made them a lot of money fortune-telling, and, and her demon is cast out, and they're mad as heck at Paul and others for casting that demon out. Paul's thrown in prison. An earthquake happens. A Roman jailer becomes a Christian, and in the end, Paul claims his Roman citizenship, shows that the Philippian government is in big trouble for beating a Roman citizen and putting him in jail without a fair trial. Uh, he shook that city up. He turned it upside down, or we could say that upside down city was being turned right side up. And then the second charge is in verse 7. They are acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. Again, there's an element in which this isn't true, in that Paul wasn't there to overthrow any government. Paul is a guy who believes in secular human government. Just read Romans 13, which he would write later. Caesar has his legitimate role in human government, Paul, I think, would argue. But here's where it's kind of true. If there's any question of a higher allegiance between Caesar and Jesus, well, for the Christian, there's no question at all. Jesus is Lord. Caesar isn't Lord. In less than a decade from this point on in the book of Acts, there'll be a different Caesar who starts enforcing emperor worship. And it starts testing and weeding out Christians. Will they say Caesar is Lord? Or will they, like the three Hebrew children of Daniel, say we will not bow, we cannot bend, and not confess Caesar is Lord. So Christian, take note of this. We can expect that there will be times of a fork in the road, of a decision to make, of faithfulness to Christ, or of some form of denying him. We will have forks in the road. We will have ultimatums put to us. We will face, at times, half-truths, misrepresentations, maligning. We can expect that, at times, our motives and our intentions will be misjudged by the world. We're seeing that more and more all the time. Oh, you people are bigots. Oh, you hate those people because of their lifestyle, they say. When that happens, will we fold or will we stick with Christ? We can expect senseless opposition and rejection. Jesus said, the world hated me, it'll hate you also, and it will hate you because of me. I wonder if these young Christians in Thessalonica had learned that lesson yet of what Jesus had taught. Hopefully they had, because they here were facing a trial that is very reminiscent of Jesus' trial. Jew and Gentile stirred up a city, manipulated the government with half-truths and lies. They weren't about getting to the truth. They weren't interested in that. They just wanted to put as quickly and as simply as possible, put an end to this competition 
to this distraction, to this inconvenience, to this message rubbing them the wrong way. And it worked with Jesus in Jerusalem, and it worked here in Thessalonica as well. Verse 9, the rulers of the city required Jason and others to hand over bond money to ensure that Paul and Silas would leave the next day. And so they do. Paul has to leave behind new Christians, a baby church. That's not his custom. He's going to have to leave them in the throes of persecution. And he won't be able to get back to them for some time. And it will tear him up. So let me encourage you today to read a letter he wrote to that church probably about three months after he left. He wrote it with tears. He wrote it in anguish. He wrote it rehearsing and remembering how they believed and the persecution they faced once they believed. It's a beautiful letter. Thirdly, we must encourage biblical reexamination. That's the lesson we learn from Paul's time in Berea. He faced persecution in Thessalonica, so he went on down the road, and 45 miles later, he finds himself in Berea. And as is his custom, he goes to the synagogue and begins teaching, much like he did, no doubt, in Thessalonica, reasoning from the scriptures that Christ had to suffer and be raised. Now, in Thessalonica, some Jews believed, but most of those who believed were Greeks. And now, it's a little bit of the inverse in Berea. On the whole, the Jews of Berea embraced what was said about Jesus as the Christ who died and was raised. They were more noble, it says, verse 11, than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things that they were taught were so. And then they believed, many of them believed, as well as some Greek women and others of high standing. They came to believe in Jesus because Paul spoke and they heard it. They came to believe in Jesus because Paul didn't just speak, but he, he spoke in a certain way. He reasoned, he explained, he pointed to passages and other passages. He proved that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and die, and Jesus of Nazareth fits that bill to a T. But they also believed because they received that word. And even more so because they then received that word and daily went to the scriptures on their own to see it for themselves. There's a wonderful scripture-centeredness to all this. The Bible is the authority. It is for Paul at the beginning of our passage, and it is for the Bereans at the end of our passage. And doesn't this come back to that application we've talked about already of using the Bible in our witness to non-Christians? Not everyone we encounter with the gospel will know how to use the Bible as well as the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17. But even in the case of the Bereans, it wasn't merely an exercise in self-discovery. Paul was teaching them. Paul was explaining and showing and reasoning. But then they saw it for themselves. So we can do something similar with whoever it is we're engaging, whether they're, they're Jewish, whether they have some background and familiarity with the Bible or not. We can show them in the Bible and through the Bible. We can encourage them to reconsider what they have believed based on what they see in the Bible. This is wonderfully liberating. The Bible does its work. We, as Luther said, we simply let it out, right? It's like a lion in a cage. You simply let it out. It's not our gospel. We didn't come up with it. And so even today, when we witness to non-Christians, we can, we can encourage them to have the Bible in the driver's seat. Of course, not everyone will trust the Bible 
to be in the driver's seat. Some people have legitimate questions about the trustworthiness of the Bible. And we Christians should be patient with their questions and answer them as best we can. But others we know, whether driven by resentment or fear or some other motive, they just don't even want to engage with the Bible. Many in Thessalonica were like that. They didn't even want to engage with what Paul was arguing from the scriptures. It's like like the religious leaders in Jesus' day. The only time they came to him with a Bible question was to try to stump him for him to lose credibility. But then when he answered it brilliantly and perfectly, they went away simply to conspire on the next attack. They weren't interested in in talking about the Bible. But it it is a, a noble thing, we're told, about the Bereans. They engaged with the Bible. They had the Bible in the driver's seat. I encourage you to encourage that. And if you've never done it, to do it, to get a Bible, to start reading it with someone who can point out some things to you. And then you just keep looking in the Bible and see if it starts ringing true to your own observation. You need to do that. The claims of the gospel are so monumental so eternal and so crucial that they can't go unanswered or unresponded to. They cannot be easily dismissed. Some people seem to respond to the gospel much like a solicitor who comes to the door selling something. Is anyone else like this with solicitors? I don't care. I don't, I don't care what they're offering. I don't care what they're selling. I don't care how good the carpet cleaner is. I don't care how better the smoke alarm is. I don't care how much greater those stakes are than the ones I get at Smith's. I don't care. I'll answer the door on accident. <laughs> I'll be nice while you're there. But I just don't care. I, I just want this to end as soon as possible. I, I want you to provide for your family, just not through this guy, okay? I don't care if I'm missing out on something. Some people treat the gospel like that, like it's a, like it, like it's a mutual fund that might be better than the one they currently have. And if you miss out on it, well, you, you still got a mutual fund. but this is of eternal significance. I mean, either Christ is God in the flesh or he's a wacko. You better get that right. Either hell and heaven are real or they're not. Either heaven and hell depend on trusting this gospel or that gospel is just a sham. If you're not a Christian, it's worth your time. It's worth your energy to figure this out, to have some conviction. I pray you would. I pray you'd begin to if you haven't. But let me suggest also that this Berean paradigm, searching the scriptures daily to see what they heard was true, that paradigm is for conversion and discipleship. It's primarily for conversion here in Acts 17, right? This leads to their salvation. But I think Luke records it for us and puts it the way he does so that Christians to follow who read the book of Acts will be reminded that this is the manner of life for the Christian. The Bible is always in the driver's seat, not just when we're considering the gospel for the very first time, but in everything we are taught, in everything we hear, in everything we have believed. We test it according to Scripture. We keep doing it. And so we can apply this, I think, not just to evangelism, but to our church, to Sunday mornings, to sermon listening, to Bible teaching. Notice that the Bereans didn't suspiciously and immediately reject what Paul had to say simply because it was new to them. Take note of that. Some things are going to be new to you. Take note. 
the Bereans did not cling to tradition over truth. They were open to the possibility that there was something new they hadn't seen before. But they didn't merely take Paul at his word. They had to see it for themselves. They weren't indifferent about getting to the truth. Neither were they lazy or half-hearted about getting to the truth. Daily, they examined the scriptures on their own. They didn't trust themselves to discover the truth. They weren't looking at themselves as the measuring line for what is true. They didn't just see if it felt right in their soul. They tested it to the measuring line of Scripture. The Reformers had this great Latin phrase, norma, normanda. I forgot the rest of it. But it's, it's, Scripture is the norm of norms, which cannot be normed. <laughs> it's the rule of rules, which cannot be ruled. The Bereans didn't believe in Jesus because it was the growing cultural sentiment of the day. Yes, the gospel was spreading, but this wasn't the hip thing to embrace for Jews. They didn't simply come to believe in Jesus either because it was new and novel and they had this bent towards what is new and novel. For what it's worth, the Berean paradigm is a factor which shapes our sermons here as a church. It's why we go through books of the Bible. We want to have our nose in the book. We want to see how God revealed himself to us in this book particularly. We want to be able to show some measure of our own homework when we preach to you. So you can see for yourself that what we're saying is from the word of God and not of our own thoughts. Now lastly and quickly, we must be relentless with the mission. We must be relentless, as Paul was here. The, relent the opposition was relentless. See verse 13, Jews all the way up in Thessalonica, when they learned that the gospel was spreading in Berea, they came down a hundred miles, a hundred miles, a two-day journey at least, they, they travel a multi-day journey. Imagine false teachers here in Albuquerque, and they go to Chicago, and we say, you know what? We're loading up the van. We're driving all the way to Chicago to get them out of that city. That's what these people did. They drove, or well, they rode all the way to Berea to stir up trouble there. The, the opposition was that relentless, and so the gospel mission must be is relentless and more so. If we'll ever turn the world upside down for Christ, if, if, we'll ever, if we'll ever write this upside down world for Christ, we've got to be relentless with the mission. Paul and Silas, they were forced out of Berea. That probably wasn't their first preference. But they simply got in a boat 300 miles later, they were in Athens. That's going to lead us to our passage next week. Paul in Athens. And the gospel goes forth there. It's like whack-a-mole. You know that game? This thing of opposition against Christians is like whack-a-mole. I mean, you, you go to whack them, they're just going to pop up someplace else. So we can be confident in God's plan. We can be confident in Jesus' promise to build his church. But it will be painful. Opposition will be real. We may get displaced. Some of us may volitionally go to uncomfortable places where there's less gospel so that someday there's more gospel. But oh, what a glorious mission it is. Let's pray for God's help. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You tell us to be still and know that you are God, that you will be exalted among the nations. 
We thank you for such grand promises. We thank you, Lord, for your majestic glory shown to us in what you do, in how you work. We thank you for your marvelous plan. We are humbled, honored, and awe-stricken to be included in it, to be used by you for it. We want others to join us in it. And pray, Lord, that you, perhaps this day, in this room, among these people, would advance your name even further, that you would penetrate hearts, and you would put the gospel seed deep within, that it would be real, that they would be saved, that they would join us in representing you to this world in hopes that one day your glory will cover the earth as waters cover the sea. We long for it, Lord Jesus. Do it for your namesake, we pray. Amen.